the Ivy Hampton Health Executive Webinar Series. Today's presentation is entitled Re-Engineering Lean Care Management and Automation in a Value-Based World, presented by Jerry Green, VP of Applied Quality at IBM Watson Health, and Christy Sanders, Director of Implementation at IBM Watson Health. Before we begin, I would like to review a few housekeeping items. First, you have a control panel on the right side of your screen. You can minimize and expand this panel by clicking on the arrow in the upper right corner. Second, you can submit questions using the question panel located near the bottom of your screen. You will try to answer as many questions as you can at the end of the presentation. Finally, all registrants will receive a copy of this presentation and a link to the recording within two business days after the webinar. The information will be sent to the email you registered with. At this time, I will turn it over to Jerry. Jerry, take it away. So I'm Jerry Green, Vice President of Applied Quality. Uh, which includes Lean Six Sigma training and deployment. I'm also a Lean Six Sigma master black belt. I've been doing this for about 17 years. Uh, we also work with our healthcare customers on training their staff on some of what you're going to be seeing in this presentation. My name is Christy Sanders, and I'm Director of Implementation at IBM Watson Health. I've been in healthcare over 10 years on both product and implementation and product delivery teams working with health systems to deliver tools that enable them to proactively manage their patient population. I've spent several years working directly with health system leadership, administrators, and operations staff, as well as the business and clinical teams who directly interface with their patients. I'm also a Lean Six Sigma Black Belt, and I look forward to sharing some of the best practice strategies that I and the members of the IBM Watson Health Services Delivery Team see on a regular basis as we work with clients from complex integrated delivery systems to small and mid-sized physician practices. So this agenda is what we will be going through today. Uh, first, it's going to start with why lean and automation? Why is it important in healthcare? Then we're going to take you through the five lean steps and strategies. These are very traditional lean, and then Christy is going to show how those apply directly to healthcare. Then we're going to have a conclusion and then questions and answers. Why lean and automation? In order to lean out any process, it's important to address all three legs of the stool, technology, people, and process. When you insert a new technology, and that can be one of our products at IBM Watson Health, or anything you'd use to automate care management work within your organization, you must plan to address processes related to that technology, as well as consider the people who participate in and around that process. Otherwise, your project won't succeed like you want it to, and it certainly won't be lean. When you change one leg of the stool, you must address both other legs or you'll be off balance. So we're going to be focusing on the process uh, stool, uh, leg of the stool. So if you look at the first two, technology and people, those are generally asked for. You get a new technology. You want to make sure that the people are trained on how to use it, where to click, where to drag, what to put in the text boxes. But a lot of times what's missed is redesigning the workflows around those technologies and skills in order to maximize and optimize uh, what you've purchased. New technologies change the way people work. Clients come to us and need help with process redesign and training when we implement these new tools. And we begin by ensuring that the data coming to us is sound. And we ensure through our integration expertise, extracting data from over 50 different EMRs, as well as through our implementation discovery process, that we cover the many different ways clients document clinical information. The first step is to ensure we build the foundation of complete and accurate data. As the data from multiple sources flows into the system through our automated engines, our products consume that information and categorize patients according to the type of intervention needed. Fully automated solutions that provide a safety net with minimal impact to your staff ensure that patients in need of chronic or preventive care are automatically routed back to your primary care physicians and specialists according to the communication protocols your system selects. Then we supplement that safety net with team-directed tools which enable your care teams to act in areas where you aren't seeing the improvement you like and to target patients who are in need of further intervention. 
Finally, individualized tools empower your care coordination teams to proactively manage those priority patient populations. Our implementation processes incorporate lean principles so that when we deploy these new tools into the processes you've already established, help you update them, or in some cases, help you design new processes, and then we provide the training you need to successfully maintain those processes over time. As we work with clients across the country, we help them identify things that interrupt their workflow. In the value stream map above, we've identified the handoff between staff to ensure a smooth flow of patient information, ensuring staff have planned for the patient's arrival and are prepared to address any gaps in care. Especially when practice staff work with centralized care management, social workers and dietitians who may not be on site at the practice every day, it's important to identify those handoffs and inputs to the process because those handoffs are key places where processes can break down. The end goal is to ensure the patient flows through the system uninterrupted. We help clients work through those barriers for each member of the care team. Define value from the patient's perspective. So we use many tools in Lean, but because this is at a 50,000 foot level, we wanted to highlight those that we use every single time. It's very important to the process uh, improvement. So we start with the Kano model and defining what the customer wants. And we really like this model because it's broken down into three type of needs. There are the basic needs, which are the must have. There are the expected needs that the patients are clearly asking for. And then there are their wow factors where patients don't even know that would exist. What's important is that you never want to trade off something that's wow and seems really cool for something that's a basic need. Basic needs are called the satisfiers because when it's present, a patient or a customer is not going to thank you for having it there. But when it's not present, that's when they're going to complain. An example I like to use that everybody understands is a coffee shop. So when you go to purchase coffee from a coffee shop, you do not say, I want hot coffee. You just order coffee, and you expect the coffee is going to be hot. And when the coffee is hot, you're not going to say, thank you for the hot coffee. But when the coffee is not hot, if you got it lukewarm, you would go back up to the counter, and you would complain, and you would say, my coffee is cold, and you'd either leave it on the counter and walk out, or you would ask for another cup of coffee. The expected, that's what you're ordering when you're at the counter. And then the wow factor would be something the coffee shop does that's really cool. They give you a coupon after you buy 10 coffees and you get a free one, those type of things are the wealth factor. But you never want to sacrifice a must-have with something that's a wow factor, and then you must deliver what's expected every time. So this slide depicts some real-life examples of basic needs our clients have identified. As Jerry said, we use the Kano model to ensure we cover the basic needs as we improve and to ensure we cover the needs of all process stakeholders. So you never want to give up a basic need for a wow. Using a tool like this helps us visualize what those needs are. For example, if your patients don't know there's construction at the office and are late coming in because they couldn't find where to park, then it won't matter if the care manager has developed a written care plan. The entire flow for the day will be interrupted and he or she may not have the time needed to review that plan and set goals with the patient. So using a Kano model helps us keep those basic and expected needs front and center. No charter, no project. That's what we say. If you do not have a charter, do not have a project. Every single project must have a charter. A charter releases the resources and the people to work on the project, and it must be signed by the champion sponsor. The sponsor of the project must be someone at a high enough level where they can assure that the resources are released, that the barriers are removed, and that the project continues. And they should be the person that the toll gate reviews are given to on a periodic basis, and the champion should be the one to ensure that if there's any impediment, they are removed and the project continues. So here's an example of something we did in a recent boot camp. The client has created a project charter geared towards lowering A1C scores for poorly controlled diabetic patients. 
the client's doing a few key things in creating this charter. They're looking closely at what they measure. They're ensuring they're consistent and programmatic in how they measure. And the stakeholders are also thinking about building in short-term wins. And from the beginning, you want to create a problem statement you can measure that is relevant to what you're trying to achieve, that clinicians care about, and that you know you can build in and quantify a short-term win early in the project. You want to provide that definition that will empower your team to act. So depending on where your organization is when you start an improvement project, it may be appropriate to look at improved process measures like more A1C tests or cancer screenings, uh, ordered or scheduled, or immunizations administered, things you can count. Or you may decide to measure improved patient outcomes, having already tackled those process measures. It could be more appropriate to start by counting the percent of staff in your pilot locations who were trained, the number of care managers actively using a new tool each day, the number of communications you send to patients, or reducing the percent of patients who opt out of the program. But you want to carefully consider where you are and how you'll show progress to keep your team engaged. In the charter attached, the client we worked with was looking to improve the A1C testing rate by 5% by the end of the next quarter. So we can work with the project team to take some very concrete actions in order to ensure they meet their goal. Map the value stream and identify issues. One of the tools that we use before we do the mapping is referred to as the 5M and P. All inputs would follow under one of these categories. I've got some examples here. So people would be physicians, nurses, patients, anyone who would be involved in this process. Methods are certain checklists that you use, approaches, workflows. Machine, pretty much anything that's equipment. Uh, could even be a vehicle, could be routers. Sponges, paper, glue, title, those things would follow under a material. Then you have your measurement systems, which we would place a thermometer under there, story points, blood pressure, lab scores. Sometimes there's a confusion between is this a measurement or is it a machine, because sometimes the machine is doing the measurement. doesn't really matter which category you put in. It's no big deal, as long as you don't forget it. And then Mother Nature is very important as well as you look at your design, because those are things that you cannot control. We often think of Mother Nature as temperature, rain, wind, those type of things. But it also includes organizational policies, uh, HIPAA, you know, things like the NCQA. Those are rules and policies that you must build your design around because you cannot change those. So using the five M's and a P, we do that on the wall and we leave it right next to our map so that as we map, refer to that to ensure we're not forgetting something as we're going through the mapping process. It can be quite frustrating to get a map done and then realize you've missed some key elements and have to go back and do it again. To reiterate, we use this tool to ensure we don't forget any inputs. Because project stakeholders have identified a clear scope and method to measure success, we know which processes we'll look at that can impact our improvement. This is a real client example. As a team, we brainstormed all inputs to the process to ensure that once we've mapped it, we could be sure we didn't leave something out. We've seen examples in value stream maps where what we were focusing on, pre-visit planning for care-managed diabetic patients, for example, was missing key inputs because someone had forgotten to include the dietitian. So we may have a tendency to see only what's right in front of us, and this brainstorming activity ensures we get the benefit of all the knowledge on the team so that our improvement efforts are sound. Always map the current state in detail. What's important about the map is you want to map what's happening to the thing or the entity that's flowing through. Don't focus on mapping on what people in the process are doing, what the workers are doing. In this case, focus on what's happening to the patient in detail as they flow through the process. And it should start at extreme and end at extreme. Always start in extreme so you don't miss something in your map. Map the value stream end to end regardless of the functional groups that the patient flows through. Map the patient. This becomes a very effective change agent tool. Uh, it evokes emotional response. 
Uh, when you have a process that the workers feel is a quagmire and it's really messed up, when you map it out, it should look like that and you're going to be able to focus, here's where the problem areas are, here are the constraints. It becomes a common language for everybody to use. Again, it identifies sources of waste, what we call non-value added activities. It identifies potential inputs, actions, and decision points that impact the process. And it really serves as the foundation for your improvement. It's easy to do. It's not hard. Everybody understands it. And it can be done on butcher paper with sticky notes and markers. Use the lean criteria to identify the non-value added activities once you have completed the map. Again, the map needs to be in enough detail that you can identify those. Lean has a criteria of three elements, and it doesn't matter what order you, you go through these because they're all and. If any of these are missing, then the activity is non-value added. The first criteria is the patient must care about it. The entity flowing through must care about this activity. If they don't care about it, then clearly it's not providing any value. The activity must change the patient or knowledge about the patient. If it's just filing something or moving a patient from here to there or inspecting something but not changing anything, then it's not really providing anything. Lastly, the activity must be done right the first time. If an activity results in rework because of a mistake or an error, the second time through, any time through after that, every single step is non-value add. Even if the first time through it's value add, the second time through becomes what's called a hidden factory. It's lost capacity, lost resources, reworking something that could have been focused on a new entity flowing through. Also to help with understanding what's non-value add, we use the Moodle wheel. The Moodle wheel is a lean tool that will help you think through uh, whether something is waste or not. And there are eight elements of that. And if any activity would fit with any of these elements, then it is non-value add. Starts with defects. We use the term downtime, by the way, downtime to help remember. Defects, incorrect data, incomplete information. Every time something comes through, somebody has to spend time, you know, go finding out what the right information is, any mistakes. Overproduction is preparing extra reports, storing report on somebody's desk that's never looked at. The time preparing that report is non-value added. Making too much of something, waiting, batching work, downstream workers or resources are not ready. That's waiting. Unused creativity in healthcare is generally not working at the top of license or what we call legal allowability. We're not listening to somebody who has a great idea just because of the level that they are in an organization. Transportation are things like traveling to and from a facility, but it's also walking, having to leave an exam room to go to a copy machine or having to leave the patient to go walk and get something. That is transportation, and it takes time away from the process. Inventory, very much tied to overproduction. Uh, it's purchasing supplies in bulk, for example, and storing in a cabinet. Motion, very similar to transportation, but it's more, I'm kind of in an, in an area, I'm in a closed area, and I'm doing too much reaching, moving, stepping over here to get something, stepping over there, and it's just too much movement. Excess processing is sort of a catch-all. It includes things like multiple sign-offs, most meetings downstream inspections when something should have been done right the first time, rework and approvals, those fall under extra processing. We use another tool you may be familiar with, it's very common, it's one of the seven most important tools in Lean, called a fishbone, sometimes referred to as the Isha, Isha, Ishikawa diagram from the inventor, and we use it with the five M's and P that we've developed already, and what we call the five Y process. Starts with the problem statement, which is the fish head. Then we use the five M and P's as the major bones, and then the process called the five Y. Five Y is you just identify potential failure mode, or one that's occurred, and you ask why. And you keep asking why until you get to the root cause. Research has shown that 
99% of the time, before you get to the root cause, you will do that before you reach the five why. So very seldom would you ever go six, and that's why they refer to this as the five why process. And it's very simple to do. Anybody can do it, and it's amazing what you will get out of it. And it ensures that you don't fix a symptom and that you actually get to the root cause. Instead of using a Band-Aid on a symptom, you can fix the root cause permanently. And you place the root causes on the diagram as the smaller bones. A very good visual for everyone to see what the main root causes are for an issue. So in the example above, the client was looking to improve performance on falls prevention. You can see how the client used the five whys to identify the major branches and that they fall across the different process inputs from materials to Mother Nature. The client considered all inputs to the process, nurses, the way they scored fall risk, the way the initiative was presented to staff via the falls packet, how they measure, the tool they use to measure, and the way patient care is documented or diagnosed. The client found that staff had poor commitment to this measure and some unplanned expense with regard to how they were going to measure it. The fishbone and five whys help visualize the root cause. Eliminate waste and allow the patient to flow through the value stream without interruption. So this is a concept that tends to bake the noodle. You know, we're taught to watch the workers to see how busy they are. But just walk out sometime in your organization and look around. Workers are busy 99% of the time. But then look at the thing flowing through. If the thing flowing through, in this case the patient, is not being worked on, then there's no value being provided. So don't focus on are workers busy. Focus on is the patient idle. That's the red X. You, anytime the patient slows in the process or stops, it's going to affect revenue directly because it's going to affect the volume that could actually go through the workflow. Some of the waste elimination strategies at a 50,000 foot level, once you've identified the root causes and the non-value add, there are three things that you're going to want to do. One, first priority, eliminate it. Do not improve an activity that could be eliminated. For example, if you're throwing reports on someone's desk and they're never reading them. Just eliminate building a report because it's not being acted upon. Second priority is to automate. And automate, there's two elements of that. One we're going to talk about is called poke yoke, and the other one is auto-populate. When I think of auto-populate, be very careful when you automate that you're not doing what's called manumation and that you're building in something that's very kludgy and is really no different than what they did in paper. When I think of auto-populate, I think of Amazon.com. When you go order from Amazon, they have streamlined their process so well that as long as your information is in there, you can immediately buy something, and it's really streamlined it for their customers. So that's auto-populate. The third thing is to simplify. Things like reduce handoffs, eliminate redundancy, collate co-locate sequences and tasks. I've seen cases where people were walking a long distance and making the patient wait when if they just moved something closer or put it in the area, it would cut down on that transportation. Reduced approvals, especially when there's multiple approvals, just go to the main approval. Standardize things so that it's the same in every single area so that as people move around or transfer from one place to another, it's always the same. The other thing standardization does for you, if something's not working, it's easier to see what it is. If everybody's doing it different, it's sometimes hard to get a handle on what the real problems are. Reduce motion, prioritize efforts, balance your resources to the constraints, and consider one piece flow. And then we're going to be focusing on one that's called 5S. One way to ensure that defects are eliminated is through poke yoke and automation. Poke yoke is a Japanese term that means mistake proof. There are two types, detection and prevention. If you look at the error proofing spectrum and you go all the way to the far left, those are things that are awareness, and awareness is important. It's instruction, training, visual guides, and those are very important. Just keep in mind, if you stop there, as new employees move in, employees move out of your organization, you're going to have to continually train. If the processes change, you're going to have to continually train and you're going to have to continually change your visual guidelines. Again, those are important. What you really want to do is you want to build processes that it's impossible to make a mistake. That's poke yoke. 
starting with detection. Detection means that an error has already occurred, but it's not going to make it to the next step before it gets fixed. So it's better to detect it up front. Those are systems that you put in place just to ensure, okay, an error has occurred, a bell goes off, an alert goes off, and I know an error has occurred. Let's immediately swarm on it, fix it, do a root cause analysis, and make sure it never happens again. The best is proactive, to build in things that make it impossible to make a mistake. Now you've removed human error, you removed rework, going through the process again because a mistake was made. So that's poke yoke, and that's what you want to focus on are those type of things. To mistake-proof your processes, we've learned from clients across the country how to identify and address items that can cause a process to fail. For example, if implementing standardized pre-visit pre planning across the system, we know that it's important to address things that prevent staff from adequately preparing for the visit. It may be necessary to incorporate additional drop-down menus for data entry. That may seem obvious, but it could be that the way things were set up years ago should be updated to allow for better documentation. Perhaps at that time the focus was on allowing for flexibility and customization, but now care teams can be impacted by items not entered discreetly. You may need to create or update standard work procedures or better delineate team roles and responsibilities. Better yet, you might automate communication protocols to remove the burden on your staff altogether. That can help ensure that no patients fall through the cracks. It's important to periodically look at the elements that cause non-value-added activities because they change over time and because we may get used to or continue to accept the barriers we see on a daily basis. And by revisiting what can cause rework, stakeholders may be able to alleviate non-value-added activities for their staff. The bottom line is that you want to identify and address items that would allow someone to make a mistake by taking an action they shouldn't take or by missing something and then ensure that doesn't flow downstream. There are so many things you can do to lean out waste across the health system. This slide lists additional solutions we've worked with clients to implement to reduce defects, overproduction, waiting, and unused creativity. One of the biggest examples I see with regard to unused creativity, enabling staff to work top of license. Um, by clearly identifying standing orders for a specific component of a patient's health, medical assistants in most states can take action to enter and or complete an order so that the entire care team is plugged in and activated and the burden for managing a population doesn't lie squarely on the shoulders of your physicians and care managers. Here we've listed ideas for how to lean out waste related to transportation, inventory, motion, and excess processing. Regarding inventory, physicians or care managers may rotate to conduct one nightly group diabetic visit each month to address patient demand for visits. Sometimes patients who are less likely to come in during the business day may be more willing to come in the evening, and they may also see benefit from interacting with patients who have the same chronic conditions. Group visits can have the added benefit of improved patient satisfaction and improved adherence to care. Excess processing is another area we see clients frequently address. As new tools become available, your staff won't need to spend time looking up and documenting whether patients have gaps in care like they used to. We frequently work with care managers who have historically carried a binder or a notebook containing the care gaps they looked at for each patient one area of the EMR at a time. Instead, they can use automated pre-visit planning tools or care management tools to do that so they don't waste their valuable time doing something a tool can do. Instead, they can focus on working with the patient to set goals and change the behavior or get tests done. Stakeholders may need to follow up more closely with staff to address the reasons why they aren't using tools already in place. But again, training, communicating goals, and providing extra support when deploying new tools are ways the health system can support the staff into these new workflows. Implement the improved process and let the patient pull the value through the workflow. 
So up to this point in your process improvement, everything is on paper. And although it may seem difficult to go through that, it's the change management that it's all about. At the end of the day, getting the change in place, that's where the hard part begins. We use Cotter's eight steps for managing change, John P. Cotter. He's a known Harvard professor, and he developed this process many years ago, has many books written on it you can find by doing an internet search. So the eight steps that we go through here is one, create a sense of urgency. Your map and your visuals go a long way in doing that. That's why it's important to map so everyone can see it, make it transparent. transparent. Also use things like you know business case, net present value, ROI, patient satisfaction scores. You just want to highlight things that this is the reason why we need to do this and make it visible so everybody can see it. Next, form a guiding coalition. The guiding coalition are not just the champion and the sponsors and those at a higher level. It's anybody up and down the organizational hierarchy who's really looking for a change. Make sure they're brought in because sometimes, even though it may be somebody at a lower level, they may have the ear of somebody at a higher level and their voice is going to get heard that way and they can help uh, with the change. Create a vision for the future. And when we're talking about a vision, we're not talking about your organization's vision or your company's vision. Everybody has those. In this scenario, a vision is what is it going to look like when it's completed? What are the patient satisfaction goals? What are we going to do? When it's done, what's it going to look like for the patient and for organization? So that's your vision. And you want to over-communicate that. You cannot over-communicate it. Communicate everywhere. We use newsletters. Make sure it's cascaded down in management meetings, emails. Just keep it going. Sometimes we'll use posters around the office and put posters up with what our goals are. Communicate those. Step number five is empower action. And that really follows to the champion and the process owners. Just make sure if the team comes up with an improvement that's going to help your patient, help improve what you want to improve, that they have the empowerment to do that. If you're not going to empower them to do that, don't start the project because there's no need going through all this work. So at the end of the day, we're not going to let you do it. Step number six is create short-term wins. You can see I have an arrow going. So we have an arrow going from number six to number two. And the reason for that, when you look at your map and you realize all the root causes and disconnects, you can't do everything at once. Don't try to. What I have found is it's much better pick a win that you can get quickly, even if it's a medium impact win, that you can do in 30 to 60 days, you can put it in place because that helps engage everyone and say, hey, this process really does work, this method does work, there's more we have to do, but now we know this works. So create those short-term wins, especially at first, as opposed to going for a huge impact win that's going to take 12 to 24 months. Because by the time you get there, your guiding coalition is going to be discouraged. Okay? Don't let up. If the champion and the project leader do not bird dog this project, it will die. It will fail. So make sure as the project leader and the champion, you're holding people accountable. You're setting up the meetings. You're making sure barriers are removed. Don't let up. Keep it going. And lastly, make it stick. Research has shown that most process improvements and changes take about 90 days for it to become the normal way of work. So as soon as the project's done, don't close the charter and walk away. Again, the champion and the project leader have to stay with it and monitor it until it becomes the normal way of working. So now we're going to talk a little bit about pull. So what is pull? Pull is no one from an upstream process, step or activity, produces or moves the entity, in this case the patient, downstream until all workers and resources are ready. So in this example I have here, we've got a five-step process. You do not push someone to the next level until they're ready. You pull. So as this yellow dot at the end moves out, step five would pull from step four. Step four would then pull from step three, step three from step two, and then step two to step one. Using a pull system makes delays in waiting transparent. When I push downstream, step one pushes to step two, step one doesn't know how long the patient waited at step two. And step two 
doesn't know how long the patient waited at step three. And so visibility to the wait time and the disconnects in the process are lost. Most of the wait time should be at step one. Then it becomes visible because now I can visually see where my delay is at and how long that delay is. So using a pull system brings transparency and helps optimize your scheduling. Less wait will result in higher patient satisfaction. And then lastly, less wait. When you can reduce that wait time, will increase velocity through the system. It makes um, workers be able to focus on that entity and swarm until it's through the system faster and it will increase your capacity through the organization. Maintain the gain and pursue perfection. We use a process called 5S. You may be familiar with it. It's, in, it's one of the top lean tools. It's a great tool and it can be done very quickly. There are five steps, sort, store, shine, standardize, and sustain. For sort, you keep only what is needed in the area. You, whatever you need in that area, that's what you put in that area. Nothing else is kept there. They're putting in their own area where they're needed. Then you store. Within store, it's store and label. Make sure everything is obvious where it's at. If it's in a drawer, make sure you've labeled what's in that drawer. When you open the drawer, I need to see what's in that drawer labeled again. Some places use clear drawers where you can see in the drawer, but make sure it's labeled what it is and what's in that area. It also helps you know when something is out. Shine is just keep it tidy and clean and organized. Make sure that it's organized. Standardize is all areas must be set up the same way and every area that's the same so that when a person goes from one area to another area but they're the same type, everything is in the same place. That's going to cut down on looking, searching, trying to find something. And again, it's going to increase the value-added time for the patient. And then sustain, you need to have a plan to make sure that, at least periodically, that these areas are reviewed and if anything's out of order, they're put back in order. One of the examples we have is we actually use this process for how we organize our computer systems for our ISO certification. So if one person goes from one department to the next, everything is set up exactly the same way. Their work instructions are the same way, their, their tools they use are in the same type of area, so people can move around and not have to look and try to find things. So it's not just physical things, it can also be the way you design your, your uh, computer systems. When you're done, always compare before and after. It's very important as you honor your employees that went through this process and improved it, as your champion looks at it, as you uh, communicate the importance of what you did, without having before and after data, it's really hard to do that. So track before, what were my A1C scores before, what are they now, right? This is a control chart we used. You can use a bar chart. You, it doesn't matter. Just have some way that you can show before and after and what the real improvement was. They will go a long way as you celebrate and you're going to do future projects. Then monitor and close. We call pursue perfection. Right? You want to go back, review the charter again, review the patient values. Do we need to refine, redefine tougher targets? Right? Or are our targets where they need to be? What do we need to do here? Find additional ways to remove. Are we done? or do we need to do some more to improve this process? Again, remember it takes about 90 days. Only the champion, the sponsor, should close the project. So make sure the sponsor looks at the process, the before and after data, and says, yes, I am satisfied. If not, then pursue perfection and keep going back uh, to, to the beginning. Monitor and measure the key measures, whatever those are, forever. So if it's A1C scores that you were trying to lower, you have to keep monitoring those scores over and over so you know when you need to recalibrate and go back again to do something. In conclusion, we use this picture diagram to help make it stick. Creating patient value using lean. These are the five steps we just went through. Define patient value. What does the patient want? You have to have a written charter, some of the things they may want, no waiting, I want a reminder, whatever it is, make sure you identify what your patients want. Once that's done, then you want to map and identify waste. Those wastes are the things that impede what the patient wants. 
what the entity flowing through that value stream needs and wants, anything that interferes with that is waste. You ain't waste or downtime. Defects, overproduction, waiting, unused creativity, transportation, inventory, too much motion, and then extra processing, which would include mm -hmm. approvals, rework, and those sort of things. Once that's done, remove the waste. Look at the process and the value stream. What would it look like with all that waste removed? It should be an end-to-end -end process that has no interruption in the flow for the patient. Again, up to this point, everything is on paper. So you want to implement the solution. We use Cotter's eight steps to help with that. Again, this is the hard part. And you want to ensure that you're pulling the flow. So in this case, the clinic should pull the patient through. And then the patient should pull through what supplies are ordered, what other things are needed. They should dictate what's needed in order to ensure that there's no interruption in that flow. And then lastly, pursue perfection. We talked about the five S, sort, store, shine, standardize, and sustain. Pursue perfection until you feel that the process is where it wants to be and then something else is more important to work on. And then continue to monitor it so you know when it sort of goes out of whack a little bit, you know you need to recalibrate and you need to do something again. So that's the process we just took you through. So remember, in order to lean out any process, you must address all three legs of the stool. Our philosophy is geared towards helping clients insert new tools and technology in order to automate and improve clinical and quality processes within your organization, providing training for the people who participate in those processes. So just a note, we have a guide called A Guide to Lean Healthcare Workflows. This is a free guide that delves into the five steps, no cost. Uh, this guide goes into the detail of what we talked about plus more. It's not written to be read end to end in one sitting. Uh, but goes through the five steps. It's very useful if you want to do a five Y process, for example. It has a step by step guide for that. If you want to do a Kano, there's a step by step. How do I do this? So it's a guide. It's free. You can just do an internet search on a guide to lean healthcare workflows, and you should see this IBM Red Books come up. Click on that. Again, it's a free download. Very useful if you want to, you know, work on some of these lean process improvements for your organization. And that concludes our presentation, and we're going to be uh, looking at some of the questions and for the next few minutes to answer those. At this time, you can submit questions using the chat box located near the bottom of the control panel. We'll take some time to answer as many questions as we can. We'll take a minute for the questions to come in through the queue. So one of the questions was, will we share the slides? Yes, those will be, those will be shared. So Jerry, here's one question that you might like to answer. Um, one of the participants asked, when we say a charter, do we really mean what is the goal for the project? So maybe you could talk a little bit about that. That's a good question. So a charter would include the goal. That would be one of the main elements would be a goal. It also needs to include things like what is the problem statement? What is the current state that I want to try to improve? There usually needs to be one of those. There can be many, many goals that are attached to that. You can have more than one goal. Um, for example, you can have a goal to improve customer status, patient satisfaction, but also I want to improve um, the revenue through the work stream. Okay? That could be the same goal on the same charter. Um, charters also need to include who's the champion. No champion, no charter. The sponsor needs to agree to what the project team is proposing, and they must sign it off. And it should also include who's going to be the, the project leader uh, and who's going to be on the team. You may not have all the information at first, but that's okay. It's progressively elaborated. And as you're talking with your champion and some of the subject matter experts you're going to put on the team, you'll get a little better information. And so you can continually improve the charter over time. Good. And then I saw a question. Um, I used an acronym that, that not everyone was familiar with, and my apologies. Um, and an EMR is an electronic medical record, and really in this context, because we can consume data from 
um, all kinds of different systems. Um, you can really insert, um, you know, EMR with practice management system or, or data from other sources as well. Um, but the point was that we can extract that, that clinical scheduling billing data in order to fuel uh, the products that we use. So one of the questions uh, that we received is, lean principles, can you illustrate the application of these principles in the context of IBM Watson? And I'm going to focus on an example that uh, we used with, with Christy, and she led with her team. And w at the time, the implementation process was very kludgy. Uh, it was old, uh, took a long time to do that. Christie's team came together with subject matter experts. They mapped that process out. We identified the constraints, the bottlenecks in that process, and then put a plan to remove those. And by doing so, we improved the implementation time significantly. And Christy, I don't know if you want to follow up with, with what you did there, if you can remember. <laughs> I'm sorry, Jerry. I was, uh, I was pulling through the questions to try to answer some of the last ones. The, the, the process improvement work that we did at the most recent Lean Boot Camp, no, at the implementation, you did with the implementation team. So one of the things that, that was done um, is before that, uh, the implementation process, there was really no standardized work. And so Christy standardized the workflow for that so they could onboard new employees very quickly, people could come in very quickly, uh, standardized the work across the teams uh, so that she could identify where one standardization process not working, they could continue to improve that. Sure, and I think another thing we did, and, and I think that's what's so great about the way that we work with clients is, and, and we call it, we, we use our tools on ourselves, um, that we identified some areas in our process where um, we, we occasionally would have some rework, and what we did was we documented all the reasons that an error could flow through the system, categorized those, and then we use some tools like the 5Y and also an FMEA, which is a tool that can help you identify root causes. And then once we did that, we were able to kind of get tactical about implementing a solution. And those are the kinds of things that we do with the client. Um, you know, we begin the implementation with a very clear project scope and roles and responsibilities. The first thing we do with the client is, um, is conduct a session geared towards them clearly specifying the objectives that they want to accomplish um, when they purchase the tools. And then everything we do after that is, is geared towards delivering on that um, project scope and on those objectives. And and we use a lot of lean tools as, as we help clients deploy um, some of those process improvement initiatives. Okay, I have another question here that's related to um, maps such as Visio are sometimes hard to communicate. How do we use our maps to communicate to the entire, uh, all the stakeholders, um, what's going on? And, I have my opinions on that uh, from the years. Um, I really prefer to use a butcher paper with sticky notes, uh, swim lanes, and, and just use markers to you know, write down on the sticky note uh, what the verb and the noun is for that activity. And what I've found is by doing that illustration, it makes it very visible. We put those up in the hallway where everybody can see it. We did one recently with a client, the chief medical officer came down and looked at it, it's like, oh wow, now I can see the problem. I use those. I very seldom use Visio. We usually use Excel to put it in, which is very similar. Uh, we generally only use those type of tools when we're done, and we want to formalize this process to be followed in the future. Uh, as I'm going through process improvement, I very seldom make it electronic. I just make it on a map. I take a picture of my phone. I can upload it with my charter. And I keep it that way until I'm done. So that's that's my approach on that because it makes it transparency and it brings engagement with the people who are, who are building the map as opposed to doing it electronically at that time. Jerry, we had a couple of people who joined just a couple of minutes late and asked if you could just quickly reiterate what the Kano model was. Okay. The Kano model is an approach, a brainstorming approach uh, we break it down into three different categories. 
the must have, sometimes referred to as the basic needs, the expected needs, and then we'll refer to as the wow factor. And the importance of the Kano model is to ensure that basic needs are not missed. Expected needs are asked for, so we know what those are. And then wow factor needs are something really cool that the patient or the customer doesn't even know exists yet. Sometimes, though, the basic needs are missed. And you put a process together, if you miss those, you're going to have dissatisfied customers. So the basic needs are dissatisfiers. What that means is if a basic need is not present, we're going to have dissatisfied customers, regardless if I'm meeting their expected needs or if I'm building in wow factors. An example that we use is always use as a coffee shop. Uh, if you go into a coffee shop, you never ask, may I please have hot coffee? You just say, I want coffee. And if you want cold coffee, you will say, yeah, I want a cup of, of iced coffee. But when you just want regular coffee, you don't say, I want hot coffee. You just say, I want a cup of coffee, and you tell them how you want it. If you get your coffee and it's hot, you're not going to say, oh, thank you very much. I appreciate you making my coffee hot. But if you get your coffee and it's lukewarm, you're going to be dissatisfied, and you're going to complain. And you're going to go put your cup back on the counter and say, I need another cup of coffee. Or you're going to put it on the counter, and you're just going to leave because you don't have time. So those, the reason for the Kano model is really to ensure that we do not miss on those basic needs, that if I design those out of my process, I'm going to have dissatisfied patients or customers. I had um, one question um, that, that we get a lot on the implementation team, and, and the question is, how do you deal with doctors or, or other clinical staff and their resistance to change uh, their workflows? And that's something that we all go through um, when we have to make changes at work. And I think really there are a number of things that we try to do to help um, physicians and other care team members go through that change. Um, number one is, is we anticipate it and we expect it. So when someone comes into my office and they want me to improve the work that I do, I'm naturally a little resistant. It's just human nature. And so first, we expect it and um, we prepare for it. Um, the, the number one thing we can do at the onset of a project is try to engage with a clinical sponsor. And so if, if there is a, a chief medical officer or other clinical lead, uh, that can go a very long way towards answering physician questions at a level that they can understand. Another thing we do is we, we try not to add much burden to the physicians at all, right? They're, they're, already, um, they're already very busy, and if, if a, uh, the chief means of improvement uh, is going to be adding more work to the physician, then we know that it's going to be harder to succeed. And so what we try to do is um, engage with the entire care team. And so there are things that medical assistants, nurses, care managers, dietitians, other, other staff members can do to reduce the burden on physicians. And I think a lot of times when providers see that, that we are not adding more work onto their shoulders, then they, they tend to be a lot more interested in what we're doing. Um, it's good to be transparent, though, and to show some quick wins. So if we can have medical assistants start an order or tee up work for the physician, and then we can start to show an improvement in some of those early process measures, then um, physicians can see that, you know, a little bit of change is good, um, and, and we can help get their buy-in. But there, there are a number of things, and it's, it's a big focus on, on what we try to do as we engage with them. Another question is, what level of training do you suggest team leaders have to coach the lean process? And my recommendation, again, this is, this is my opinion, I've been doing this for a while, and this is sort of what I've, I've come up with. There's Lean Six Sigma. You can see how those have been combined together. They used to be separate. I would definitely focus on lean. Uh, lean first, because you don't want to improve processes that should be eliminated. Start with lean. Lean, I think, has a much bigger impact on healthcare, a faster impact. Uh, and for lean, you know, a person needs to have enough training where they understand the concept enough where they could get up and teach it. Because when you start to lean this out and you're going to use some of these tools, it's very important that the project leader can get up and explain to the team members what the tool is, 
and how the tool is going to be used and how it's going to benefit our project. So every, every project leader really becomes a coach and a trainer as they go through the process improvement, especially for those that have not been exposed uh, to lean. So generally, I would say probably 20 to 40 hours of training would be recommended. And it's also we recommended that someone who's just trained have an opportunity to get mentored and coached uh, by someone else as they go through their process improvement. Okay, and it looks like those are all the questions that have come through the queue right now. Um, as a reminder, uh, you will receive a follow-up email that includes the presentation and the link to the recording within two business days via email. Also, please take the brief survey when you log off the webinar. We would love your feedback on today's presentation. I'd like to thank both Jerry and Christy for their time today. And at this time, the webcast has ended, and we thank you for attending. Have a wonderful day.